Before we turn the floor over to our FAA colleagues, just a, a quick background. Uh, the first symposium was held, the COVID pandemic, when we had the tragic loss of our student, John Hauser. Uh, it was brought together the first time we brought our academic partners together with our industry professionals, mental health, medical professionals, and most importantly, bringing in our FAA colleagues, because we need to all work together in order to see change occur in this issue with our industry. So it's, it's fascinating to see how this has grown. I'm happy to hear so many schools are here today, as well as still our industry partners, our, men, our mental health and medical professionals, and our FAA colleagues. I do want to see Ann Hauser, do you want to say a few words to the group as well as? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I am so glad to see so many people here today. And um, it's kind of bittersweet to be here because uh, John and I toured here uh, when he was uh, between junior and senior year of high school. And we all, it's, and I was reminding myself on the way over that we almost missed the tour because driving from Chicago halfway here, John looks at his phone and, and he says very quickly to me, I think we're going to be late. And I said, why? We left a little bit early. Well, there's an hour change, Mom, and I don't think we factored that in. Do you want me to drive? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and we made it here in time, but... Um, yeah, it, uh, it will be three years next Friday that we lost John to suicide. And this and the connections of working with each other, sharing our ideas, sharing stories, uh, is going to continue to become more and more important as we talk about mental health and work to reduce stigma around it. And also to share the changes that are happening on the FAA level with improved and changed rules. I think that is going to be a key to um, the enactment of these of these changes. So I'm excited to be here today. Certainly, please feel free to come up and uh, talk to me or if you have any questions or things that we can help. Uh, Dr. Bierke has been an amazing partner, as has UND been, with advocating um, and, and education around mental health. And we hope to, uh, going forward, continue to, in my family to attend this very, very important conference. Thank you. Thank you Anna. So we are going to pass the stage over to the FAA. We thought it would be first important to kick off the symposium this year with an update on all of the changes that are happening with the FAA. Again, in order for these changes to be fully implemented, we need to know about them, we need to be aware of them. Uh, as educators, as students, as industry, we need to stay abreast so that we can help communicate out to those changes. One of the individuals that has been at every single one of our aviation mental health symposiums is Dr. Penny Giovanetti. She was with us at our first symposium in 2021 and loves us so much, comes every year to give us <laughs> updates uh, from the FAA standpoint. And so we've asked her, along with Dr. Dan Danzig, who is the psychiatry branch manager for the Office of Aerospace Medicine, uh, to give us some updates. We'll also be able to open it up for a Q&A. Uh, for them as well, and that'll kind of lay the tone. And I want to encourage everyone, this is our chance, these next day and a half, to really get to know each other, collaborate, discuss, make connections, because again, we all need to work together to help they institute these changes. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Giovanetti. Okay, I think I'm, I think I'm wired. Can everybody hear me? I think that's for the video. I think you need this for the room. You're going to need that for the room? That's for You're going to be double mic. Well, I am double mic. Oh. All right, do we hear? She is double mic, actually. Yeah, our, uh, Let me come up here. There we go. I'm the one. Let me come up here to be a little bit more in the center so you people over here don't feel, you know, like second class citizens. All right, so with no monitor down here, so I don't have my cheat sheet, so I'm going to have to work it uh, from here. But uh, thank you all for coming. Um, this is just a, a wonderful event. It has grown and happy to see so many schools represented. Um, I would also like to take a minute to introduce another new member of our staff. In the back corner hiding back there is Dr. Forrest Pavel. He is a new clinical psychologist uh, that recently uh, joined us. He's uh, an Army reservist and former Army active duty, so he has a lot of experience uh, in supporting uh, mental health in aviators in the military. Okay, so um, let's go to the first slide. Okay, so there we are. 
All right, so the one thing we can clearly all agree on in this room is that safety is job number one. And sometimes how we call the safety risk may differ um, between us, but I think we are all agreed that this is the major goal. So I just wanted to share with you what's going on in terms of um, demand. And the line, red line on the top is the number of applications that we've received by calendar year. As you might expect, the work that you folks are doing and your students constitute a huge part of why that line is going up like that. We already know that for calendar year 24, we have exceeded this. And so that line is going to continue. So when we meet next year, it's going to keep going. Now, the line on the bottom is actually the special issuances that we've given. Normally, they track pretty well with each other. But if you're really astute, you can tell that the slope of the blue line on the bottom is actually steeper than the slope of the red line on top. And what that suggests is that proportionally, we are giving more special issuances than we have in the past. I would like to believe that that is because there are people that are coming now to be certified that might not have come in the past because they have complex histories. And we are certainly seeing an increase in complexity of all the cases, not just the mental health cases, but the medical cases as well that we are seeing. And so that is driving this relative increase in special issuances. Uh, I'd also like to highlight some of the realities that challenge us. You know, the runway is not age adjusted. Um, the weather does not provide reasonable accommodation. And I think the, the reasonable accommodation term is meaningful in the academic community. And clearly, you can't just pull over and stop when things go wrong. And finally, aviation is a terribly unforgiving so we have to be vigilant all the time. Now, I know I showed this slide before. Just a curiosity, how many folks are here? This is their first summit. Whoa, OK. Well, then I won't worry. <laughs> I won't worry about showing a slide again that I've shown before. So it's not a great secret what we do in the FAA. I, I know it's much more fun to say, oh, it's a secret witch's brew that they make behind the curtain and nobody knows what they're up to. When it comes to mental health, this is what we sit down and we do, all right? If the problem comes back, how likely is it to come back? And how severe is it likely to be? Standard SMS stuff. You've heard this. So no secrets. Now, the challenge that we have been on the past three plus years, about the time frame when these summits began, was getting out to the community and doing two things. Number one, dispel the myths. And number two, destroy the barriers where we can. All right, so in that intent, well, I'd like to get a little bit of engagement here with the audience. So I'm going to explore some myths, and I'd like your feedback. Now, you've got to be honest, so don't be looking around the room and say, oh, you didn't know that, whatever, because that helps me to know how prevalent some of these myths are, and it's important. You know, we can't dispel a myth if we kind of don't even know it exists, and I could tell you stories about people that ask me questions that think that something was a certain way and it wasn't. So, so let's try this. All right. How many of you think that if someone you know, if your friend um, reports in the process of, of, of getting mental health counseling, reports that they've had thoughts about suicide, how many of you think that, that that's it? That's the end of the career. Done. OK. So nobody in here is paranoid about 
sharing that you've had suicidal thoughts. That's good. Okay, let's take it one step further. How many think that if you've had suicidal thoughts and you've progressed to the stage where you plan something, like, you know, I know I have these pills in the medicine cabinet, or I know I have a gun that's um, not locked away. How many think if you've actually gone to the stage of having planned that your career's over? You know, you're, ne you're, never, gonna, you're never gonna get by that. How, ma how many think that's true? Some think that's true. That is not, okay, that is a myth. A myth with a little bit of qualification, okay. Think back to the risk assessment slide we just showed. If we think that that was a one-time event and the whole picture of the individual is very positive and that event is unlikely to occur again, that person will get a special issuance or they may even get an unrestricted medical, okay. So, we got one myth already. Let, let's try this, take this myth a little further. Yes, sir? I think just from my mind, so it's not that you never get it back, it's just the process is going to take forever. Okay, separate subject, but important. But, you know, if I, that first question you asked, like, hey, maybe I have thoughts or something like that. Okay, you're grounded for how long? I think that's the bigger, that's my mind. Okay. That you'll never get it back, it's just going to be a long, arduous process. Got it, okay. And, and it's, that's a different issue, I think. Relevant, but... Uh, well, that's why people won't admit it. I, mean, I flew in the military, too. I'm just telling you. You don't... Never happened. Okay, I, and, and I understand that. But that's a reality. That's not a myth. So I'm trying to explore some myths here. What you're saying the myth is that you'll get it back. I'm telling you from our perspective as a pilot, we're like, don't say it. Even if it's just a temporary thing, you know, you had a problem with your life, family member, they passed away, or I mean, that's happened to me, you know, so I'm good. Okay. So I don't know. If yeah, I mean, I, me. you're right, and you're going at the global issue. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus here a little bit more on, on the Decision making a, a little bit based on incorrect information. The, the information that there's delay is correct. The information that if you've ever had a plan for suicide that you can't ever get your medical. That is the part that's incorrect. That, that's where I'm going. So, so I'm going to take it the next step. Acknowledging your point. Okay. If I have actually attempted suicide, Career's over. Never going to get a medical. How many think that's true? Lots. Okay. Myth. However, the bar keeps getting higher. We have given special issuance to individuals who have, in fact, attempted suicide. And again, we go back to that risk assessment when we make that decision. Okay, let's try another one. Um, if I've ever had depression, it's all over. If I ever report it and get a diagnosis of depression, I'm finished. How many think that's true? Couple, okay. No. Dr. Dancic spends his days going through records and, and giving special issuances to folks with um, uncomplicated depression. Do it all the time. In fact, probably close to 100% in cases where the depression is well controlled. So let's take that one another step. Okay, what if you actually have that diagnosis called major depressive disorder? If somebody gives you that as opposed to a unspecified depression. How many think that your career is over once you've got that label? A few, okay, okay, that's good. I, 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 you guys get points for honesty. Again, not true. Not true. We always look at the whole case and we understand that sometimes mental health care professionals will what we call upcode a diagnosis. You know, you use a 
more severe, for lack of term, uh, lack of better word, um, diagnosis, so that they can get better reimbursement. So we look at the case. We don't look at the label. Okay. So let me give, take you another step. Okay, you've had an event, major depressive disorder, gotten over it, and now it comes back later. Now it becomes recurrent major depressive disorder. So how many in the room think that once you had a recurrence, that you are a recurrent major depressive disorder, career's over? How many think that? Ah, good. Myth. Myth. Okay, the only difference is if you've had a recurrent major depressive disorder, more than likely you're going to get your certificate back, but we require that you be on treatment. Most times this means being on an antidepressant medication. Sometimes we've actually given special issuances for follow-up with psychotherapy only. So that just depends, but that's not a career ender. So. I thank you for participating in that. So let's talk a little bit about what Dr. Birke asked me to talk about, really. And that is, what's happened since the first one of these in 2021? So we have a whole list of things. You know, we've had, this is now the fourth summit. We've had some research published from Dr. Hoffman about healthcare avoidance in the pilot population. We came out with the first disposition tables on PTSD and situational depression. That occurred about two years ago. That was the first time we had ever allowed AMEs to issue certificates to some individuals with those two diagnoses. In the past, they all came to us at the FAA. What else? We've approved additional medications. I'll show you a list of uh, the old and the new. We've discontinued recurrent periodic screening in the antidepressant program. We used to require COG screen every year or two years, depending on what class is certificate. We did a study a couple years ago. We looked at 425 airmen who were uh, renewing their antidepressant special issuance. We looked at their COG screens. And we determined that in no case, in no case in those 425 airmen, did the repeat COG screen predict that they would not get their special issuance. Those folks who were not renewed were re not renewed for a different reason. It was not the COG screen. We said, no value added here. We got rid of it almost overnight. OK, the other thing is that you folks in the aviation schools have started to develop peer support programs. Are there any other schools that are doing that now besides UND that have started? Yeah, uh, super from Auburn. Auburn, super. Okay, the rest of you, you know, the peer support program and, we, and we've got um, some folks here, Rondo Flynn from APA who can tell you all about how valuable peer support programs are. It takes work, it's tough, but whatever you can do to put one of these programs in place, I think you will find it paying dividends. But there's more. Okay, what else? What else have we done? The first guidance on ADHD and the institution of a fast track as well as a standard track. This thing was over three years in development, a lot of work by our special consultants in neuropsychology. Dr. Pavel can talk to you more about that. He wasn't part of developing the um, fast track, but he understands all the underlying principles behind what was done. We'll show you a little bit more on that in a bit. Um, then came that Horizon Air incident. And I'm sure you are all aware um, I don't know how many watched um, Lie to Fly. I did not. Um, but there was an airman who ostensibly had a depression problem, knew it, but did not report it, and almost created an American German Wings. 
So that stirred up again all the interest. If, if there was any lag in the interest in, in, in the intervening years between German wings and that incident, it stirred it up again. And so NTSB held a summit. Uh, they invited lots of people to come and um, tell stories. There are some people in the room who were at that. Um, and back to your point, sir, what I heard over and over again in that summit was delays and costs, delays and costs, delays and costs. A tough nut to crack, but, but that was the message, I think, out of that um, event. And then the FAA administrator decided that he was going to hold an aviation rulemaking committee. And you've met, or at least you've seen, the folks in the room who were on that committee. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that specifically at the end. And finally, uh, Dr. Danzig has been working very hard for at least a couple of years on shifting the thought process away from labels, otherwise known as diagnoses, to a risk-based decision making. And we expanded the number of labels um, that an AME can issue from those two that we talked about, PTSD and uh, situational depression, to 13. And I will show you that list in a bit. So I know ADHD is a big deal. It remains a big deal. We have a big section now in the AME guide. That is where you need to go. Look that up. What you'll see there is that tiny print on the right, which you can't read. But you go to the fast track, which is the third choice down there, and uh, I think you will find that interesting. Now, what's the Cliff Notes version of the fast track? No symptoms and no medications in the past four years. We did a lot of research on this compared with other agencies, um, Air Force, Navy, et cetera, um, that are also dealing with this problem. No other psychiatric history. Getting an evaluation from a community psychologist or neuropsychologist who is familiar with ADHD. The point here is to get to what exactly is the issue. Because we know a lot of folks come with that label of ADHD that number one, never had it. Or number two, may have had it and have now essentially outgrown it as their frontal lobe matures and as they pick up coping skills as they grow older. So that and, of course, you know, bringing all the documentation, it's important for the psychologist to give us a good picture that they know the whole history. All right, so. I said we had added several new antidepressant medicines. The ones in green are the ones that we started with in 2010 when, when you started the SSRI program. The ones on the other side are the ones we have added in the last two years. First, bupropion, extended release, that's important. And then the other three uh, just uh, past May? Okay. Good. The other important thing about this is now we are not just SSRIs. Bupropion is its own weird thing, and I can never remember what group it falls into, but it's all by itself. And then the others are SNRIs. So that we're moving forward um, with options for folks. OK. And then what about the new AME decision grids? The ones in green were the ones I mentioned that we did a couple of years ago. It was our, kind of our toe in the water thing. Again, there are criteria that go with which ones the AME can issue and which ones they still have to defer. But there are options for the AMEs to issue if the criteria are met for everything on this slide. And Dr. Danzig is going to talk in a little more detail about those, and I think maybe you're up, sir. The reason I put this slide up here, um, I've, I've had this slide that I've used with uh, other groups, 
with Tadalpa, um, with uh, AMEs. When we think about um, what, what is in the media, right, it influences a lot of public perception and, of course, uh, the stigma, right? This is what we're battling against because this is not all of what mental health or substance use uh, disorders are about, right? This is part of the battle that I have. Well, in general, this is the, the battle we have in, in stigma and mental health. Forget aviation, right? Is the, is what we what we can't see in front of us, we don't understand, right? That's that's like when you have a family member that's coming down with something and you're not familiar with it, you might be looking at that stigma as a provider and trying to assist that family member or the the hospital system or your other doctors in understanding what's going on with a patient. But now when you see such incidents like this, including the horizon air, um, <laughs> we're trying to, to undo what is, this is not all of what mental health is. This is why I have this slide. I'm sure most people would understand the concept I'm trying to get across here, so I don't want to belabor this point. Um, but on the aviation side, this is what we're trying to battle. This is what I, I have this slide to help put into context a little bit what Dr. Giovanetti has already talked about. We're looking at um, medical conditions, including mental health, that may have any impact on uh, subtle incapacitation, the risk for subtle incapacitation or acute incapacitation. And our research, research folks down at CAMI have already uh, started an initiative uh, about a year ago um, to define what those, look, what those look like in terms of ICD codes. Um, to, to provide some evidence behind it using large-scale uh, ICD uh, research that's already been done. And so I was part of a working group there to start doing that. Um, and it's a step-by-step -step process. This is just one conceptual way of looking at it. Obviously, this is when, when it comes to actual flight, uh, but obviously you could be on the ground doing, uh, doing your pre-flight planning um, you know, a week ahead of time and be impacted in your planning. Right when you when you haven't even taken flight in terms of where you're at with the with your with the I'm safe checklist. Anybody familiar with this slide? Let's see if I can use the pointer here. Sorry, which one is the button for the one? So, if you many people might be familiar with this Yerkes uh, dachshund. Dodson um, performance curve. Obviously, you want to have some amount of stress to perform well, right? Too much stress over time can lead to distress and frank burnout. I want to point out two things from this slide, though. Um, when it comes to the pathology that we see in mental health or substance use, you can unmask a disorder with regular stress. But certainly by the time you get into this red, red curve down here, um, that, that is... We would, we would certainly expect if, if there was something that you were genetically predisposed to uh, or just the acute amount of stress you've had over, that it's now become chronic, certainly something would become unmasked at that point. This is the first time I'm using the slide with this group, so I want your feedback on it. You know, how many of you have already started to, are being required to delve into the, the FAR AIM and the CFRs as far as pilot certification? Show of hands, okay, right. I do get questions on this, so I thought it'd be useful to, to spend a few moments before I talk about our updates to go over what, what is it that we have to look at in terms of standards for airman medical certification. It's in the Code of Federal Regulations. You can Google it. It's very easy to find. It's basically part 67, and the verbiage is the same for whether it's uh, first class, second class, or third class, 107, 207, 307. Um, I'm not going to go over each one, but I want to point out that um, you know, we have what's called specifically disqualifying conditions at the top there uh, with personality disorder, with overt acts, substance dependence, psychosis, bipolar, substance abuse within the past two years. And the clinical side, substance abuse would be akin to uh, certain definitions of substance misuse. Um, and then there's uh, the subpart C, which I'll have on the next slide I'll go over. Uh, but even before I joined the FA, I didn't realize, well, there's a whole subsection, part 67, that deals with the kind of the functional medicine uh, aspects as well as uh, medications. And that's under uh, 113, 213, 313. And that's where things like the uh, antidepressants that we've talked about are covered, right? So basically, we end up defining a medication as prohibited, restricted, or conditional. Um, and it has to go through a whole pharm pharmaceutical 
uh, committee to, to look at just the medication without the conditions that it's prescribed for, is it aeromedically safe from a side effect standpoint, right? Or could there could be cognitive impairment associated with it or, or other risks of other things like seizure risk, right? Because antidepressants have an elevated seizure risk. So we have to look at all of those things. So this is that subpart C. This is why I'm showing this because this will give you a little window into what, in the next slide how, how we look at when we take a, a billing code or a diagnosis code and translate it to the Code of Federal Regulations and what I've been trying to do backwards, in essence, to, um, to give more guidance on what AMEs can issue in the field. That's how, th that's the actual verbiage at top, which I'm not gonna read for you, you can read it there. But as you can see, the word anxiety and the word depression is not there. So this is what covers everything else in the DSM, essentially, that you might find, right? And then, so that's left up to the federal air surgeon every, every time we have one to look at policy updates for these. So I'm trying to come more in line with our other specialties and doing that, at least right now, this is what we have, we call a diagnostic-based certification, uh, medical certification. And as Dr. Giovanetti pointed out, the FAA as a whole on the medical side is trying to move to an SMS-based, but how do you do a medical model certification and move to that it takes time. If there's especially, in my mind, and of course I'm biased, that lends itself to a uh, more SMS risk-based model, it would be uh, mental health. And, and you'll see why here in a second. So this is, this is a complicated slide, but I do want to cover this because I find that um, physicians for sure are very receptive to this. You guys should be, would be very interested in this to understand, at least on the, on the FAA side, how we have to take, this is for all medical conditions. I'm just showing you how I've tried to look at it conceptually on the mental health and substance use side. So we have to take um, a medical history, what we might find in the, in the medical documentation of a patient, an airman, and what, what a potential DSM or ICD codes might be. So here's just an example here. You know, you might have something that has to do with what we call externalizing behaviors. Um, that are translated into a certain type of personality, what we call maladaptive personality trait. Um, certain personality traits are adaptive and we don't, they're not disordered, or we don't consider them abnormal. And then of course there's some abnormal ones. And so we have to figure out from that, what does it look like then over here on the CFR side, what would be the, what would you see in the letter that you might get if, if you don't meet the medical standard? And essentially, that, that would, in essence, require what's called a special issuance or waiver if the person's treated for that condition or has been treated, and we would like to provide them a, a medical certificate. So, questions on this? Oh, I want to. This is interactive too, so please uh, raise your hand if you want to. You have a question on this? Uh, Every medical certification, when you go to get see your AME, at the, if you don't have any history, you just get a regular, uh, what we call unrestricted medical certificate. But if you have certain medical conditions that are disqualifying per these Code of Federal Regulations, um, then the Federal Circuit has the purview to issue a special issuance. And the special issuance is essentially a waiver, right? To still give you a, a medical certificate, it's just not unrestricted. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, so I wanna re just repeat the question for everybody else. The question is about when we have um, regular updates or new updates, um, is there training involved for the AMEs and how do we get that out there? Did I capture that? So um, we do have what we call a grand rounds training that we provide to AMEs. Um, and basically we will have them in the evenings so that it doesn't interfere with their private practices. Uh, we've had some on uh, the weekends. We have some international AMEs, so we have to try to time some to account for, for time changes. But yes, um, on a monthly basis, we will do grand rounds. Uh, we will also try to incentivize them to attend by giving them CME. Um, uh, and then every three years, it's correct, three years, uh, AMEs are required to go through recurrent training. Um, but getting to part of your question, that is a challenge, right? These are AMEs that do this on the side most of the time for most AMEs. How do we get to all of them in a timely manner? Um, every time an AME logs into that system where they issue the medical certificate, it will tell them what, what updates we've had in the past month. 
So we also, we, that's been there for a long time, ever since we went to the electronic MedExpress. So they, they can start getting into the AME guide right away to see what the changes are. But then the actual trainings that we give them, um, we're trying to do more, you know, those regular grand rounds. Uh, we're also instituting um, a, a new, I want to I wanna call it an on-demand, that's still in the planning phase, where they could watch videos on their own time. Um, the, the hard part is whether we can attach CME to it or not to incentivize them, because <laughs> CME activity tends to be, needs to be live usually. There is a mechanism to do it on demand. I just, I just have to figure out how to get around that. Um, so as you can see, this is how we end up translating what might be a medical, even just history, maybe not even a diagnosis, into what would be a, I would call it a, a CFR determination or a CFR condition, right? Because the nos nosology that we use obviously is not a medical-based nosology in of itself. It, it by definition has to be a legal medical, right? This is codified in the CFRs. Oops. So to get to what, what are the what is the what are the most common what are the I should say what are the most prevalent uh, mental health conditions? Anxiety and depression. Anxiety conditions uh, disorders are actually more prevalent than the mood disorders or depressive disorders. Um, but depression is a co-occurring symptom or condition with a lot of anxiety disorders that are untreated. So these are just some, some, some examples. There's so many more that we've had, but as you can see, you might obtain a history of just the word anxiety, but then there's associated symptom or symptoms with that. Um, you might have these various DSM in diagnosis, generalized anxiety or social anxiety disorder. You know, there, there, you can see anxiety in any mental health substance use condition. So you can see anxiety in a substance, in a, a substance use disorder condition. So the last one, the example here, MDD, I put it out as an example, MDD would be major depressive disorder with anxious distress. The common thing I saw in private practice before coming to the Mayo Clinic, somebody, the, the primary like outside presentation to others is one of somebody who's anxious. But when you drill down into the history, you discover that they actually have a mood disorder and it just the, the main manifestation is anxiety, but internally to them, they're struggling with, uh, with clinical depression. And so in, kind of in the same vein, down here under depression, you might obtain this history depression. Is this adjustment disorder? Is the DSM um, name for situational depression? Is it clinical depression or MDD? Could it be uh, what's, what's in the DSM is now called persistent depressive disorder? Um, and that, that used to be called dysthymia. There's, there's more other types, there's many more. This is just three examples. So we have to try and define from what we have in terms of uh, the person being evaluated or what being seen by a therapist or physician, um, what is it that they have as far as a CFR condition? And I would add now, there's actually a fourth column I would like to add to this, you know, that we end up also doing at the FA, right? What was I saying earlier about incapacitation? We have to add basically an aeromedical risk assessment. So that's what um, that you see that we have to go through this whole process on the back end uh, because not, not everything is disqualifying uh, in that sense. Just some other examples, like I said, under that subpart C or Charlie, you know, we would, we would have basically, you could have other types of personality, maladaptive personality traits that you could put underneath there that don't rise to the level of personality disorder as manifested by overt acts. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, um, uh, neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder, ADHD. So everything else basically would fall into there. So I put that on the context because Dr. Giovanni started to men mention about this. Uh, one of our, uh, my colleagues that recently retired from the FA, Dr. Christopher Flynn, he gave me permission to use his slides. He did a, hit his own uh, sub-study on some of our renewals of, of the, what was back then the SSRI protocol. We're trying to re rename the, the antidepressant protocol and eventually I'm actually uh, working to do away with it as it is and replace it with a, um, a disposition table similar to what I'm gonna show you here. 
he did basically a sampling of the uh, uh, airmen that were under the a special issuance for various conditions, which I'll show you in the next couple of slides, uh, but that they were treated with an antidepressant, one of those four acceptable SSRIs from 2010. And as you can see, it was a pretty even, fairly even distribution uh, as far as, uh, you know, the, across the board, I mean, we had 31% class threes, majority class ones, some class twos, uh, but uh, almost a third of those in that sampling, I mean, this is a total of 150 pilots out of, I think it was the original sample was 500. Um, they had some type of uh, psychiatric, we couldn't consider risk factor, right? And we provided them a special issuance. Suicidal ideation, oh, I, I would define it as suicidality um, to drill down into what they had. They had been uh, diagnosed, labeled as bipolar disorder, and we determined that they did not have bipolar disorder. Um, they'd had they'd used multiple medications for treatment, uh, whether it was evidence-based or not. Um, this, this shows you a little bit more about the, the number, total number that uh, we're sampled from. Like I said, almost 500 that, are, um, that will provide that special issuance from that time period. But getting to some of the complexity, um, this actually surprised me because we don't know what you don't know, right? The, the number of conditions they might have had when we provide them a special issuance uh, could easily have been three or more. We had a, almost 10% um, of those on, just on this sample that had three or more DSM conditions, essentially, right? Bless you. But there was also um, a wide range of conditions. So anxiety may have been one, some type of related mood disorder, a de uh, what we call unipolar depressive disorder, um, comorbid, what we call dual diagnosis. Dual diagnosis meaning something that's mental health and substance use uh, disorder related. Um, other comorbidities, eating disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, is the DSM allows you can have multiple comorbidities um, diagnosed. So I think that would, uh, any questions on those slides so far before I kind of go into kind of the update? I thought that would be a, a backdrop to kind of discuss some of our updates. If you, the question was, was there any information on how long it took for those, those individuals to get their special issuances? Um, I don't have any, any like firm data um, from that study, although we could, we could look at that and we, we have that data there to mine. I can tell you from just anecdotally, uh, it, goes in, it goes in cycles and it, it, anywhere from three or four months to I've heard cases of like three years, two to three years. And, and the, this is the last 10 years so over a long period of time. Um, what we've tried to do now is, I'll get to your, your question. Uh, what I've tried to do, Dr. Janvin made, made a comment about uh, me reviewing uncomplicated anxiety depression. So what I've tried to do is, you know, even though we have now four slots for psychiatrists at the FA, what I've tried to do is get to a level that uh, the most common mental health conditions that have either no or minimal certain risk factors that um, I can educate our FA physicians at Oklahoma City allows them to either issue a special issuance without sending it to headquarters, because all our psychiatrists are at headquarters, or, like is what I'm gonna talk about here, actually gives the tools to the AME to issue. Um, because it, uh, as you can see, this, it's, an ex it's a very, very arduous um, you know, administrative process to go through that document review. Um, the, 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 the guidance we have from Dr. Northrup is, um, you know, if we can return an airman to fly, we do so. What does that mean in terms of airman medical certification? That means we have to we have to really be, be really understanding of what the diagnosis is, right? As you're gonna see, I'm actually gonna throw that on its head a little bit, but it still meets the intent of aviation safety, and I'll show why. Um, sometimes diagnosis may not matter as much, and we're okay with that, right? Um, I will say up front, though, this does not allow an Amy to issue somebody on an antidepressant. We still want those to be sent up, but I'm already working 
it literally on the middle of putting the final touches on the policy that would allow our Oklahoma City physicians to issue the majority of those uh, special issuances. Because right now, all of our antidepressant um, protocol cases and substance dependent cases eventually have to come to headquarters, right? Um, so I'm trying to, 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 to make it so that majority of those do not, we have more physicians that can review them. Um, and and in, in some cases, a legal instrument analyst can actually say, oh, this meets everything and it meets the intent. Question. Yeah, so the question is, is that they work on anything to speed up the process? That's a question that I don't know, maybe you should punt to my boss, maybe not. Um, yeah, that, one of the things I just mentioned is one thing I'm trying to speed it up for that specific form of special assurance for the ones that are antidepressants. Um, as I understand it, we are already trying to hire more FA physicians. Um, I'm, I've been actually requested for more psychiatry physicians. Um, it's, the government is a long process to get to get that approval and that those slots, like there's a whole myriad of things that have to happen. But outside of that is, we've also instituted in terms of education to AMEs, what is it the documentation we need the most that's critical for us to help us? Um, and I'm just trying to get that decision process to the lowest level, the AME that's seeing the person, because that's that would be the quickest. What is a, what is a, um, a mental health case that we don't need to, that the AME can disposition themselves. So that's what we're working on across the board, not just with mental health. Um, and that's why you can see that the, if you've heard of the AME guide, who has not heard of the AME guide in this, this room? The AME guide is uh, um, basically essentially kind of like a Bible for our, our aviation medical examiners on what we want, how we want them to issue medical certificates they can issue which things they have to defer, which things require special issuance, and just keeps ballooning in size for, for good reason, like putting up the guidance. Um, was there any discussion about ways that, that either the FAA or that um, organizations themselves uh, can support those that are taken out of the, the cockpit or flight deck for that length of time so that they can support their families and not worry about those types of risks for Bringing an issue to the table. Uh, as I understand your, let me understand your question a little bit better. Are you asking about what the FA might be doing about that, or? Yeah. So if it's, I mean, if someone is mm -hmm. taken out of their career for three to four months yeah. or two to three years, and I'm not familiar with whether that's with pay or without pay, mm -hmm. is there anything that can be done to start developing support programs for those pilots in their family? I mean, certainly, I'm not. Unfortunately, on the regulatory side, we can only do so much to require, say, employers to provide benefits or ins healthcare ins insurers to provide disability, you know, either disability plans. Um, I know on the major airlines, some of them already have some of those supports in place and they're trying to get equal mental health parity for that. Um, but it's, it's, there's a huge disparity still on that end. Um, we certainly encourage it. But as far as I know on the regulatory side, we don't have a means to require them to do that. These are great questions. I'm just cognizant of time. So I know we have okay. other panels throughout Sorry. the day. And I know Dr. Danzig still has some more slides to update us with. Thankfully, we've got Dr. Danzig here both today and tomorrow, mm -hmm. or Dr. Giannetti all day today. And so we'll be having some breakout sessions. So I encourage all of us to, to ask our questions, get those answered. But if we could let you finish your slides sure. for now okay. so we can kind of keep on schedule. So <laughs> nice way of telling me to questions. move on to the next slide. <laughs> So the intent, so we had an anxiety depression uh, update uh, this past uh, May uh, that we put out. This basically allows, the intent of this is to allow AMEs to issue um, to two of 11 conditions, which I have in the, uh, in the subsequent slide. Um, and uh, airmen could be s still in psychotherapy when they're seeing the AME to be issued, and it would be an unrestricted medical. Um, the FAA is not requiring that the AME submit us uh, medical documentation. Very key to that, and, and I'll talk about why in a second. Um, they could have been on previous um, and, uh, medication therapy. So I'm trying to bring in line what we already know from clinical medicine, clinical psychiatry. Somebody may have uh, a type of anxiety, depression, where they got the required six to 12 months of, say, Lexapro, escitalopram, and they no longer need it, right? Even 
they, they no longer need it. They're doing fine. Um, maybe it was for generalized anxiety disorder. Um, they've been, they've learned the skills that they need, and now they can be issued. But the intent of this is obviously to encourage individuals to seek preventative mental health care, which we're still trying to battle on the clinical side, as always. Um, again, getting back to the stigma. It's, and it's human nature, all of us, right? Almost kind of like imposter syndrome. We always want to try and do it on our own for as long as we're almost our own individual worst enemy, right? Um, we just want to battle through it on our own. And eventually, sometimes it takes somebody else to tell us, no, go, go seek help, and then realize it's something that it's very doable. Now, under this guidance, as you can see, they can, be, they can still be in therapy the time they see. I'm going to go over this decision tool. If they have any of these risk factors, Amy is required to defer. That doesn't mean that we're going to deny that individual. It means that we just still want to review those. So I'm still trying to come up with kind of that matrix I mentioned earlier to figure out at what, what's the lowest level we can issue these, right? Either as a special issuance um, at Oklahoma City versus having to go up to headquarters, getting to the wait times you talked about, right? Um, and at the same time, come up with something that's, you know, getting this out to individuals so that we can get the documentation, the right documentation, because that's the other battle. Somebody asked about what are we doing about the wait times. Some of it is just a matter of getting the right type of clinical documentation. We'll get, we'll get pieces of it, or we won't get the, it won't answer the question completely when we review the documents. So then we're asking the airman to go s seek out a specific independent evaluation that adds time, wait times. So that wait time that, that she, you asked about earlier, that it could be a few months to a year or two, sometimes that is actually that we've, we've now sent a letter back to the airman saying we need you know, this specific evaluation, or go back to this individual and, and, and have them answer these questions. That's what I'm also trying to do is, in the next policy update, put um, basically a standalone evaluation, like a specification sheet that community psychologists, community psychiatrists can use that's, that's standard for, for just everything. Um, it's been a legitimate thing that we need to improve, so. So this is, it's difficult to see, but you, if you Google FA anxiety depression, you should be able to come up and find this. We call this a disposition table here on the right. And, and this is only part of it. Um, it. It cut off a big part of it. But essentially, um, you couldn't have been on a more, no more than what we call monotherapy, one medication at a time in the previous, in the past, but not the past two years. And this is what, what an AME would be able to issue an unrestricted for. Um, like I said, the medication had been two or more years ago, um, and I'll show the list of conditions, a much larger slide in the next slide, but up to two of the 11 listed conditions. Um, and, and basically, that the AME thinks that you're safe in terms of where you're at for the, you've been treated for the condition. It doesn't mean that all the symptoms have to have been what we call in remission. They just have to have significant benefit from the treatment that you've, you've attained. So these are the list, up to two of these listed conditions. Remember earlier I mentioned, does diagnosis matter? That's, that's the whole Airman Medical Certification. That's what's built on our Airman Medical Certification. Is, well, mental health, we already know from the medical literature the, the disadvantages of the DSM, but that's what we have. There, there's some poor inner relator reliability in use of the DSM. There's been pushes at the American Psychiatric um, Association and other organizations to do something instead of the DSM, but it's never gained traction over the last uh, couple decades. But it's what we have, right? And ICD codes are very similar to what we use in the DSM. So does diagnosis matter? We also have an understanding that when an individual might see a licensed clinical social worker, uh, or they might be seeing an EAP individual, they're, not, they're using something that might be a billing code or not for billing at all, and they're less concerned about the true like exact diagnosis, right? They just have to put something down. So we take that into account, and I also try to take that into account in this. What would be something that's still safe for, that an AME can issue that doesn't require FA review getting to those wait times, right? Um, deferral in, in, in all cases, right? So even if it wasn't exactly generalized anxiety disorder, if it, it didn't meet the, have any of the history of the risk factors, as long as they, they're benefiting from the treatment they had or still have, the AME could issue. Um, as you can see, we, we built upon some of what we have. You know, the situational depression is still in here. 
there was uh, a lot of feedback and including other adjustment disorders. So you, there might be sit, just situational anxiety. How do you, can an AME issue that? Or a combination of anxiety and situational anxiety and depression. You know, that's why we included those. I will point out though, if you get into the, what we call the V codes or the Z codes of ICD, there's, um, there are things that are like, like uncomplicated bereavement, right? Um, it could be relationship distress with another individual. There's also V codes in there that have to do with risk factors. So don't, don't take this to mean that all V codes on the table, the AMEs understand this is part of the education we've already provided them. They have to look at that V code, they have to understand and question the airman. Um, in, in some cases, they might, the AME might require the airman to show them some of the documentation from the therapist or a letter. Um, because there are, there's V codes that have to do with parasuicidal gesture behavior, right? There's V codes with antisocial behavior, right? So this is not all V codes. I just want to point that out because you start Googling, you'll find them. It's a, it's a long list. These are just some examples um, that we, per, we feel perfectly acceptable that Amy can make this judgment, this, uh, this judgment call. So I apologize, this isn't blown up even more. I tried to blow up as much as possible. But this is the decision tool that we're asking the AMEs to use um, when looking at this. And when you, when you look at each of these, these are where those risk factors that I was talking about. And it's, again, it's not to say that automatically we're gonna deny that individual, but we need to review those at least at the Oklahoma City level. And, and they make the decision then for the special issuance, or they might make the decision initially, we just need a little more information um, with an independent evaluator to clarify you know, one or, one or more of these risk factors. And just to highlight a few, you know, suicidality, self-harm behaviors on there, homicidality, history of um, hospitalizations, uh, involuntary treatment. We want to know if individuals, we're trying to get, gather data on TMS because right now the med medical literature doesn't give us enough on TMS to, to just provide a special assurance for ongoing TMS. But I want, we're working towards something like that, right? Um, I, I know on the Air Force side, they're already looking at TMS as something that's, that's, that's okay from a waiver standpoint. Um, we just need more data to see how does it mediate the symptoms, how does it keep somebody uh, in good control of their symptoms. That's just to highlight a few things. Questions on this? Okay, I'm, I'm getting the time, time factor here, so I'm gonna turn it back over to, uh, to Dr. Giovanetti. Last, last couple slides. Okay. So I'll turn back over here. All right. Thanks, Dr. Dancic. So this this will be a little lighter, I promise. <laughs> okay, so what um, in, in looking at the ARC recommendations, which we may or may not go into depending on the time factor here, um, What were we doing in terms of educational initiatives? Because that was a very important thing that came out of the ARC. Yeah, more education, more education, more education. So uh, our Office of Communications at the FAA is helping us um, try to go through social media more than we have been. They're posting periodically, interestingly enough, medical myths as, as topics, just brief sentences, comments, um, and so uh, we're hoping that that will reach down into the busy folks uh, who look to get their information very quickly. Um, MedExpress, uh, we are hoping to put a video on MedExpress for use by people who are filling out their first application or who had a major change in their medical condition since the last time they filled it out to kind of walk them through the process and educate them uh, about it. Also, pilot minutes have been out ever since Dr. Northrup has been the federal air surgeon. They're out there. Um, I think they're on YouTube, so you take a look. They are informative and, again, brief. Uh, outreach programs, just like this. Um, when we get an invitation to come out and talk to a group and, and share our perspective, we try as hard as we can to always accept. Uh, I've done about 12 to 15 per year over the past couple of years, and um, 
Dr. Northrup has done uh, just about as many. Um, coordination with flight standards. Uh, again, one of the recommendations that came out of the ARC was that, that we should try to embed some mental health education in the formal training program. So that certainly is not something that we can do on the medical side. Um, and so we're working with flight standards as to how much of that uh, is feasible and how much we can do. And finally, Dr. Dancic mentioned the grand rounds uh, in response to making sure that the AMEs get educated. Uh, they know that updates to the AME guide come the last Wednesday of the month, just about every month except December. And they, if they have questions, uh, we have these grand rounds follow up the publication of any new um, additions to the AME guide. So um, we had some interns, summer interns, come uh, spend the summer with us and worked on a very special project. Um, and they chose to call it the Gen Z handbook. So, you know, any of you Gen Z's out there, don't blame me. I mean, we may change the name, but that's what they wanted to call it. This is not done yet. It's in draft, but I wanted to give you an idea sort of what this is going to look like. It's aimed again at that information gap, at the folks that say, we don't know what's going to happen, and so we don't want to get into this morass. You know, we'll, we'll just try to avoid this whole thing. So uh, I can flip through these pretty quickly, just for your information. To, and when it comes out, we're hoping by the first of the year. Uh, hopefully it will be useful to you, and um, all of you need to give us feedback, whether it is or whether it isn't useful. <laughs>